Hello, folks. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. This week, I've got Sterling Jaquith, wife of Michael Jaquith, who gave his testimony about two to three weeks ago. Welcome, Sterling. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. Excellent. I'll just briefly say that Sterling, I believe, met my wife a year ago, year and yeah. a half ago. Mm -hmm. And they hit it off. They've gone to a number of events together. And what has been cool about, you know, what my wife reports back to me is that Sterling is on fire, on fire for God, on fire for her family, just wants to share the love of Christ with people. And anytime I'm looking for someone to share their testimony, obviously that that has a lot of weight to it. So um, with that, Sterling, I, I really, I, I want you to feel free to chat it up. Go, yeah. go. Yeah. The whole thing. So um, I'm a public speaker. I knew from a very young age that I was going to be a public speaker, right? So like by the time I was 10 or 11, I was like, I'm going to be on a stage and I'm going to be telling people things, right? And so I definitely thought I was going to be telling them business things because I've always loved business and writing business plans. Um, I would have been very shocked if you had told me that I would be talking about Catholicism. So I was raised with nothing. Um, every once in a while, my mom would like pop up and go, let's go to non-denominational Protestant church. And we'd go one time and that was that. So I was pretty much raised with no religion. And so I did all the bad things, right? Like all the bad things um, until through high school, through college, um, I moved out of my home when I was... Um, not even 17. And I was just like, I'm going to go to college. I went to college early. So I was like kind of a rebellious good kid. Like I rebelled in some traditional ways, maybe my poor parents, I feel bad for them now. Um, but I was doing really good things like going to college and having jobs and making money and taking care of myself. So then I went to college. Ironically, I went to Seattle University, which is a Jesuit school. And I did not know what that meant really. I just wanted to be in Seattle because I thought that city was so cool. Um, so I don't have a lot of regrets in my life, but I lived one block away from the chapel that they did daily mass at every day. And like, I, I wish I could go back and relive that because that would have been so special to just be able to walk one block every day and go to beautiful Catholic church. Um, wasn't a very Catholic college. I think that's pretty well known. Um, most of the kids are not practicing Catholicism, or if they are, it's kind of a watered down version of it. And so it wasn't until I was 23 and I'd finished college. I had built and grown a business and then closed it down and moved home to help my mom. So my mom had needed some help. While I was in college, she had this huge come to Jesus experience. So my mom became this like hardcore Protestant, kind of like a Calvary Chapel flavor, right? That's kind of the kind she was, um, but like reading her Bible, taking theology classes, and I watched her life really bloom. It was really impressive. And so when I came home, she had had a big surgery. So I was, I was thinking about closing my business anyway. I didn't close it because of that, but then I came home to help her. And I was so happy for her, you know? I mean, she really did look like her life had so much more peace and sure. she had this great community of people. And, you know, she tried to talk to me about Jesus and I was like, uh, no, I'm not taking any of that in. You know, I was like, Jesus is good for people who are broken and need like a crutch. Right. That's kind of the stuff that I would tell her. Super pro-choice, super liberal, all the blue state things, whatever you think is a blue state thing. I was all of those things. And super proud of that too, by the way, like really proud of that. And so it was really that my mom asked me if I would help the pastor of her church build a website. So she, my mom had never asked me for anything, right? She just never asked me for stuff. And so I was like, okay, totally. I can build websites. I'll go help this guy. And so I would go to his house and every Wednesday, it's funny how we remember like the day, but every Wednesday I would go to his house and I would sit in his office and we would work on this website and his wife would make us dinner. And so I would work with him on the website and then I would have dinner with him and his wife. And as I began to watch them, they had this really beautiful relationship. And 
it was kind of one of the first examples of marriage that I had seen that appealed to me. So before, you know, here I am, I'm like 23, 24, I'm like, I don't want to get married. I don't want kids. I like working. You can't pin me down, right? All that stuff. It's just an institution. Like, why would you do that? And then I'm like having dinner with this lovely couple. Their kids are grown. And I just saw how really beautiful it could be. It was really attractive to me. And they were not shy about asking me hard questions about my life. They were like, what are you doing with your life? Like, what are you hoping for? What do you want to get out of this life? And then I would give them really lame answers and they would call me out on that. They'd be like, that's a pretty lame answer. Or like, that's just a sound bite. What does that even mean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is how we live in our twenties, right? Yeah. We're just like, my body, my choice. And we're like, what does that even mean? I don't even know, right? But that's just how we live. And so slowly over time, I was like, okay, maybe I might want to get married. That was like the crack. That was the crack that they came in. It's like, maybe I want to get married. And then at the time, they also ran this weight loss group. And so they took this program that they had used to help people stop being addicted to drugs and it was not the 12 step program. They were like, we're not fans of the 12 step program. We created this program where you have more freedom than when you did before you did drugs. So their point was like, you could be stronger in Christ than you ever were before. Like you don't have to feel like an addict for the rest of your life. Then they took that program and made it for like ladies who wanted to lose weight. So it was super intense. But I was like, I love intense stuff. So I signed up. So here I am in this room with a bunch of middle-aged ladies who love Jesus. And I'm like, I don't love Jesus, but I want to lose some weight. So I'm going to hang out with you guys. And the program was heavily based on scripture saturation, memorizing verses. And so I'm doing what they say, and I'm noticing how happy everyone is. And not Mary Poppins happy, but just like they know their purpose in life. And so they were willing to talk about their struggles, but it's like they knew who they were because when you have a relationship with Christ, you know what your purpose is. And so I'm in this group and slowly Jesus starts winning me over, right? I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing the word of God. I'm listening to these women and I realize, oh, I might actually decide to believe on purpose. And so I sat down my very agnostic, doesn't believe in religion father, who I love a lot. And he's very logical. And I was like, listen, I might start going to church. And I was like, but not really. I'm just kind of going because I see these people are awesome and I kind of want to get married. And I think a Christian guy might treat me better. Like I had a lot of really ridiculous reasons for joining the church. And so I like to share that because they were totally shallow and self-centered. Like my reasons for going to church were super shallow and self-centered. And so I like to tell parents who are worried about their kids, like, it doesn't matter what gets them in the door. It doesn't matter, right? God will work with whatever you give him. And so I started going to church and I mean, I just had a full blown heart conversion over to loving Jesus. Like I was like, yeah, I'm all in on that. And so it took probably a full year and I was all in on Protestant Jesus. I like to call him Protestant Jesus. That's when I was hanging out with him. And that's also when I decided for sure I was going to get married, which to me was a huge deal because I'm like kind of part of that millennial crowd. That's like, we don't really believe in that. You know, let's just, let's just live together and see what happens. Right. That's what they thought. And so I decided in 2009 that I was going to meet the man that I wanted to marry. I'm very into goals. So I set that as my number one goal in 2009. I was like, I'm just going to make that happen. And I did a bunch of things. I went to a bunch of church events, bunco nights. I did swing dancing, right? I did all this stuff. And then in um, September, I think I signed up for eHarmony. And so I signed up for eHarmony and I'm looking for a Christian guy. And I get matched with a couple Christian guys, but then they would say things like, yeah, I really love Christian music. And I was like, that's just not the same thing, actually, the same, yeah. as like being all in on Christ, you know? And so then I came upon Michael's profile. Spoiler alert, he's my husband. 
Um, and he was the first person that said Jesus and Bible in his profile. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a guy who was like reading his Bible every day, like that kind of level. And it was very confusing to me, Eddie, because he was Catholic. And I was like, I thought Catholics didn't read their Bibles, right? So I was very confused. Um, but he also loved dogs and I love dogs a lot. So I was like, you know what? I'll give this guy a chance. So we met, we had our first date and all we did was argue about the Vatican. I was like, that system is stupid. <laughs> I was like, why would you set it up like that? All the old white guys, that doesn't make any sense. They're oppressing women, right? Cause I'm still like a blue state kid, but I love Jesus. Yep. And so it was fun. He's super smart. And so we argued really well and it was fun, even though we disagreed. And at the end of the date, I was like, Hey, you're cool. I could never marry someone who was Catholic though. But it turns out we were both kind of lonely in the city and we didn't have any friends and we liked a lot of the same things. So we decided to keep hanging out. It's kind of like that lie when you go look at a puppy and you're like, we're just going to go look at the puppy, right? That's what we did. We were like, we're just going to hang out, but it's not dating. And so we ended up spending lots of time together. And I, the, the Protestant pastor who was really a father figure to me had taught me how to pray and he had taught me how to discern what God wanted for my life. I'm very thankful for that. And he had also taught me that men should be the spiritual leaders of their households, that they should really drive, drive that process, set the tone. And I really wanted a man like that. And so while I was dating Michael, I felt very strongly that God was calling me to marry him. And that was kind of confusing to me because I was like, well, listen, I'm not Catholic and he's Catholic. And, and he had actually said that he would make a go of it with us not, like me being Protestant and him being Catholic. And I wasn't okay with that. I, I had read that children that grow up in split religious households end up nothing. And so I was like, listen, mom, we're not doing that. And so because this idea had been instilled in me of how to discern God's will, and that husbands lead the spiritual household, I just said, listen, God, if you're calling me to marry this man, and I did have a ton of peace about that, you must be asking me to be Catholic. So I'll pause here and let you ask me any questions that you have, but I jumped all in without believing, not without believing it, but without doing the work, right? So I'm sure people come and talk about how they struggled and how they read books and how they did all of that. And actually, for me to decide, I just believed in those two things, and I knew God wanted me to, to marry Michael, so I just assumed he wanted me to be Catholic, so I said, sign me up, and I joined RCIA. That's incredible. So prior to the disagreement about the Vatican, what else, like as a Protestant and in that group of women, what else would you have, have objected to? Objected I mean, to? Yeah. You know, I think it's it's just like Fulton Sheen says that people, you know, that wonderful quote that says something like, nobody really objects to what Catholicism really is. It's like just our false ideas about it. And so it was just a list of that. It was like, we they pray to dead people. They oppress women. Um, it's weird to go to confession. Like, why would you do that? And then the birth control thing was a huge hang up too. Sure. Not even because at that point, I don't know that I felt strongly about what kind of birth control I would use, but I was just like, why would you tell a woman what she could do with her body, right? Like that really came in and just felt like it was supporting this idea that it's a bunch of old white men yeah. in Rome making decisions for other people's lives and that that's not okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think Michael was talking about that as well. The, the massive uh, paradigm shift occurs in not seeing a bunch of rules Mm -hmm. but seeing actually disciplines that can make you the fullest or bring you to the fullest potential of what Christ wants you to be. Right. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, so then, yeah, go ahead. Jump all in. Right. I'm like, I'm going to be Catholic. Everyone's going to throw me a party. Right. I thought it was going to be fantastic. Looking back, I realized it's such a huge deal to come into the church, but no one in my life was Catholic. So, it wasn't. It was like Michael went with me that Easter vigil and I received the Eucharist for the full time, first time, which wasn't super meaningful to me because I had agreed to be Catholic, but my heart hadn't really converted. Yeah. 
and um, then we got married. So we got married after I became Catholic. So we were married with a mass. And then I started going to the mom's group. And there are a lot of beautiful Catholics in Oregon. We'll just say Oregon. Um, but there were a lot that were not following the rules. And that was very confusing to me because here's my super devout husband who's like, we're going to do all the things. And then I would go to the mom's group and for sure they were on birth control. And then like one person I remember said like, well, I could never forgive that person for this thing that happened. And I was like, hold up. That's like some Bible 101 things, you guys, right? Like, uh, you know, you could say I'm struggling to forgive them. I haven't forgiven them, right? Like all of that is fine. But to like, just own with great pride that you're not going to forgive someone. I was like, that's just like a, a basic tenet <laughs> of our faith. Yeah. And so that was hard for me. It was confusing. It was frustrating. I felt really lonely. Um, they did not have a great community. There were no Bible studies. I mean, I basically went from this like warm hug of Protestant community to just like an icy cold nothing on the Catholic side. Um, and ultimately what it did for me was a Matthew Kelly book. I got a Matthew Kelly book and it was like, hey, most Catholics are not really being Catholic. And I was like, oh, are we allowed to say that? Right? Like it was just crazy to me that he was calling out all this stuff that I had seen. And I was like, yeah. And he said, listen, real Catholicism is true and beautiful and lovely. And that's what my husband had been saying, but it was just so nice to hear it somewhere else. And so from that moment on, I just decided that I was going to discover Catholicism for myself and own all of it. And so, I mean, I just went on a journey of reading all the books and this was two years in. So I like to say I was a pouty pants Catholic for two years where I was like, this sucks. Why are we doing this? This is not what I signed up for. Yeah. Um, and I was still faithful. We went to mass every week, but you know, it just didn't quite click for me until after, you know, I got that book and I started reading. And that's really when I decided that I would probably spend the whole rest of my life talking about Catholicism. Got it. Wow. How many years ago was that? When after the two year pouty? Phase? Yeah. So we got, yeah, we got married in 2010. And so somewhere around 2012, 2013 is when that was happening. Um, and then in 2014 is when I launched my podcast, which is, I just retired it, but, um, you know, I did this podcast called coffee and pearls for moms and we just talked about all things Catholic for five years and it was, it was pretty fantastic. And I'm assuming when you, through that process, you did, you were meeting a lot of people that were devout, that were practicing Catholicism versus some of the stuff you saw early on, right? Yeah, I did. And I beat, first of all, I immediately had so much compassion for the lukewarm Catholics because I realized it wasn't that they weren't following the rules. No one ever told them the rules. Like these were wonderful people and they weren't like, uh, that's hard. I don't feel like it. They were just poorly catechized, Got it. you know? And so that's what I realize now is like, I just want to hug all those people and be like, oh, honey, you just need to learn this or read this or encounter this saint, you know? And I feel so confident that if they had the real information, then they would make better choices. Um, but I think the compassion we have to have for people who fall away or people who are in the pews, but not really you know, practicing is just that they probably didn't get the truth, right? They probably got a weird version of it and that's what they're rejecting. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, I've, I've talked about this numerous times about my own, my own life. Um, I see versions of myself in the pews. I obviously don't know what, what yeah. they're dealing with, but you can just see this, I don't know, blank stare and I have a heart just like you do to speak to those people um, because it's not just a matter of obedience it is truly the heart that says yes as well otherwise I mean what is it and you know I think of the Old Testament where the Lord is talking about what good essentially is the sacrifice mm -hmm. apart from a heart <laughs> that is completely yeah. obedient to what I what I say you know what I mean 
Yeah. And that's, you know, it's funny because when I converted to Catholicism, um, because I love speaking, I was like, oh, I'm going to convert all the Protestants. I thought that's what I would be doing. And then I was like, hold up, we have some work to do on our side of the fence, right? Like I just realized that, and I also, my gift is not um, as a theologian, right? Like I'm not the Scott Hans of the world. And I was like, we've got enough of those. You know, I wanted to really speak to people and, you know, particularly women who just knew that something was missing. Cause when I was, you know, pouty Catholic, I was like, what is everyone talking about? Like it wasn't fulfilling and I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. And so I just want to reach all those people to say like, oh, if it's not a burning fire and you want to tell everyone, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, we have some work to do and that's fine. No judgment. We're all on this journey at our own pace, but you know, it should really be that wonderful. And that is not to say that all of us are called to evangelism, right? Because some of you may be introverts and you're like not going to be the lady who's like, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and like stopping people on the seat street, but we can evangelize in many, many ways. I just want to invite everyone to examine, like, do you just love the Lord? And would you tell someone that if they asked you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and if you're not there, let's get you to the, just love the Lord part, because it should be that kind of consuming for your life. Yeah, and you know what Michael mentioned when I was talking to him, he, he mentioned his mom making reference to your daughters and mm -hmm. how, I mean, that is a form of evangelization when you are just witnessing by the way that you carry yourself. Yeah. And, you know, it's something I would love to work on. A lot of times the people that can just stay quiet, they can just observe, they're peaceful. And what those people have done for me is... I, I can't really, I'm almost speechless trying to think about uh, the number of people over the past two years, really. They just sit back, you just sense the spirit in them, yeah. and they're not flashy, but they are witnessing. They're not talking about apologetics, right? but they're witnessing. So. Yeah. And they're living their life out. And I, I like to say, you know, if, if you were to show a picture of Mother Teresa to just someone who didn't know who she was, she was not an attractive lady. Like by the world standard, she wasn't. And yet you are so drawn in by her because holiness is attractive, right? And so she's just like, when you look at her, like you just want to cry. She's so beautiful. And, and she just has this like huge gravitational pull toward her because of that holiness, even though she was super short. And when she speaks, she would speak very clipped like she wouldn't talk a lot she would just say don't worry about it or jesus will take care of this right she was very quiet but her holiness was so attractive and so it's it's completely true you know we can be huge evangelists just by the way that we live and you don't have to say jesus to all your friends all the time for them to know that you walk with the lord and that you have the only kind of peace that you get from walking with the lord yeah. And also when friends and people that you're going to come across and you have come across that have just an array of difficulties to be able to respond as a Christian should and not just say, let me rebuke you straight away. Let me listen. And again, this is, this is great. It's no surprise that your husband touched on so many of these things. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard it, by the way. I, I was like, oh, I don't want to know what he said. I want to do mine without knowing. That's good. That's good. No, um, what the heck was I just saying? <laughs> That's pretty bad. We spend four seconds with a delay, and I, I forget what I was saying. Uh, rebuking people. So what oh. did he mention? Yeah, so in other words, he was just saying that it's the love. You know, there is a very big difference between loving and enabling mm -hmm. is also that that tool that people will often utilize and say no i'm the master judge i can start condemning people <laughs> versus yeah. let me love let me use my own testimony let's say to help someone see that there is a better way yeah. but in no way am i standing here as a judge i see that you are fallen just like me right and then together through love Maybe we can get on a better path and then pray, <laughs> you know, not just make these declarations like something's final. And I think in this culture, cancel cult culture and otherwise, it's like you make a mistake or you are 
sinful, it's over for you. It's over. You know what I mean? Totally. And I think, you know, I, I, cause a lot of moms will come to me and they're like, how did you, how did you convert? Cause they'll have a fallen away child. And it just, it's so upsetting to them. And they're like, what can I do? And I'm like, Oh honey, nothing. Like people's parents are not what bring them back to the church. Right. And I just tell them like, listen, this is exactly God's plan for them. Right. Like if we had magic wanted me to be Catholic at age five, I wouldn't be here doing the work that I did. Like I had to go through that gauntlet of all of the stuff so that I could stand here and say, like, you can sleep with your boyfriend at 17, you know, and move out of your parents' house and like still end up doing just fine. Right? Like nothing sinks us. Exactly. And clearly so many mistakes will be made. Um, and, you know, that's different than the heart that says, oh, I can go do all these things and God's right. going to do me. No, you missed the point. <laughs> you know totally. I mean? And yeah. so I just, you know, I just want parents who have kids, you know, that are falling away just to know that God has a story for them. Right. You don't know the story better than him. Right. And so you're telling him something's wrong. And what if he's sitting there going, honey, nothing is wrong. This is exactly where they need to be. And just pray and fast. And trust, trust in God, because he has the tools and the people and all of the situations that need to come together for them to choose him. Yeah. He's got it taken care of. And there's nothing we can do about it, no. specifically as parents, because I think like when we come down and we're like, you should go to church. Like, that's just not, that's not the thing that's going to make it happen. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, I, if you can, I do want you to talk about the made for greatness. I want you to, to kind of go into that realm. And I think we can tie that back to the, the greater testimony. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I had been podcasting and I've written a bunch of books and I, I speak at conferences. I also specialize in minimalism. Um, so I'd done all of that. And then I discovered life coaching and mindset coaching. And so this happened to me last year and I literally just drew, it was so powerful for me that I drew this huge line and I was like, I'm going to restart everything that I'm doing because now I see that managing our minds around things is so important. And I had gone through a secular program that, that absolutely changed my life. And I thought, oh my goodness, if you just took this program and you put it on top of the foundation of our faith, it would just change everything. And so I partnered with someone else who had the exact same experience. I didn't know that this mom was having the same experience that I had. And then we met one day and we were like, you were in that program? Oh, it was so amazing we need to do that for Catholic moms. And so we created this life coaching program for Catholic moms called Made for Greatness. And what we do is we help moms, we help them get quiet and we help them hear God's voice and understand the difference between God's voice and the enemy's voice. And when you can figure that out, which is not hard because the enemy's voice tells you you're not good enough, that you're a bad mom, that you're getting it wrong. He rushes you. He fills you with guilt and shame. Any of those feelings are always from him. And God makes things feel calm and like you have tons of time. And he may even lay something on your heart and convict you that something that you are doing isn't what he wants you to do, but you will feel it with love. And you will just go, oh, you know what? I think I need to stop reading books like that or watching shows like that on Netflix. But it, you'll have a, a warm conviction, not a I'm going to get punished and go to hell kind of feeling, right? When God is speaking to you. So we teach women how to do that. And then we teach them how to manage their minds to do whatever it is that God is asking them to do. So for me, it was start a business. For a lot of moms, it's like, lose weight and get healthier or make more time for them. So they're not running around being crazy all the time. Um, and for a lot of them, you know, it is to just grow in their faith. Like they're serving everyone and not reading their Bibles. And we're like, we didn't, we never tell people what to do, but we ask this question, like, how's that working out for you? Sure. You know, and then they know God will convict their hearts about the things that they need to do. And so we just create space for them to meet them where they're at. And this is true. When we meet anyone who's on their journey of Catholicism or not quite there, you just got to meet them where they're at and just say, what are the results in your life? Is that working for you? Because I don't need to know anything about a person 
about their specific circumstances, if they are not walking with the Lord, there's going to be a lot of tension in their lives and emptiness. And you just launched that not too long ago, correct? Yeah, we launched it um, in December of 2020. So we have a lot of people in there and we're doing great work. And um, I'm curious to see if Michael ends up doing something similar for men. Um, he works with men one-on-one. -on -one. We wanted to do it as a group. But um, yeah, I think that when I discovered mindset work, I was so nervous, by the way, that it wouldn't be Catholic. I was like, is this Catholic? You know? And I did a lot of research after that. And I, I just found more and more evidence in the Bible and in the works of the saints that really backed up this idea uh, that our thoughts create our results. And, you know, I like to say that St. Therese, she was kind of like the first life coach. And she, she said, she was like, listen, I'm going to be a saint. She just decided. And she would just say, how does a saint live? How would a saint show up to this situation? And it was her thoughts that created that results for her, right? And so we do that as humans all the time. We have these thoughts, but a lot of times they come from our culture or from the devil, right? Like, let's just pick marriage for an example. You know, we, we date someone and it's so wonderful and it's so great. Yeah. And then like fast forward 10 years in, my husband and I had six kids in eight years, right? And I could choose to have the thought, this isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. What if I made a mistake? This is so painful and it's never going to get better, right? Like these are so common when we're in marriage. Mm -hmm. Marriage can be so painful. And marriage is a crucible. It is supposed to be painful to shed away our bad layers to smooth us out for heaven, but we add pain, unnecessary pain on top of that by thinking that something has gone wrong. Yeah. And so if I can find a woman who's thinking those things and I can show them to her and say, listen, nothing has gone wrong. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. This is exactly what marriage is supposed to look like. That woman is then going to act in a very different way. Cause when we feel rejected and unloved, we like yell at our husbands. We're like, I'm worried he doesn't love me. So I'm going to say a bunch of mean things to him or give him the cold shoulder and not talk to him. I'm like, then I'll say, how's that working for you? <laughs> and it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And the other element is so what you're describing really is truly trusting in God's grace mm -hmm. and truly trusting that suffering and the like will be for your benefit. And now, like you said about marriage, you know, where each person is there to help sanctify the other. Right. And that's not going to be a cakewalk. It never will be. And when people, this is a theory of mine. If you go into it, assuming it will be a cakewalk. Well, when things go south and that suffering could have made you a remarkable example, mm -hmm. you walk away. And then you somehow assume that you're going to find what you were looking for in a subsequent relationship, mm -hmm. not realizing that there's going to be suffering re regardless. Yeah. I mean, you cannot escape God's grace. If he wants to mature you, it's so amazing. He, he really does pursue you. Of course you can resist, but those that finally surrender and let him do what he only he can do that's when just these, like I said, these remarkable things happen. So. Yeah. And it's not easy. I mean, I think marriage has been one of the biggest crosses that Michael and I have experienced. And, you know, we have had to have a ton of abstinence because of how many babies we had in a short period of time um, and some health problems too. And so, you know, we've had to just stare at each other in all of our pain, you know, and our, confusion with the Lord and being like, wait a minute. I thought that there was sacramental grace. Like, where is the grace? What does that feel like? I don't have any of that right now, you know? And, but when we focus on those things and what we get out of it or wanting it to feel good for ourselves, we never see the solution. 
Mm -hmm. never see the solution from that place where it's if you can get curious and you're right if you just acknowledge that like we're gonna run a spartan race called marriage and there's gonna be all these obstacles like if someone told you like you're gonna run a spartan race there's gonna be 15 obstacles and you're like all right i'm in i'm doing it right you would talk to yourself so differently when you were like climbing up the rope or jumping over the fire and marriage is the same thing, right? They just don't tell us how many obstacles there are. And so we're like, wait a minute, what is happening right now? And I just want to be like, you're at obstacle 1163. Don't worry about it. Nothing has gone wrong. Your job is just to figure it out. And we would show up so much more differently if we, if we knew that and we went into it with that kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, and back to the point that we were talking about earlier about witnessing those that are struggling but they can return to the lord and and find joy in those obstacles that is tremendous for evangelization like you just said you know someone may be they're not the person that's this extrovert and they're going to go out and uh, shout to people on the sidewalk well maybe they're the person in a marriage that they just keep their head down and that's all they care about they want to have a good marriage they want to persevere and people are watching i've heard that for years now people are watching people are watching well it's not this thing where it's like i need to be on my guard like no connect be in union with the spirit and keep walking and god will take care of the rest you don't need to be concerned about specifically who's watching just the fact that you are doing you're, you're trying your best to do god's will so Absolutely. And I think, you know, we had a rough, you know, last four years, we had these back-to-back -back pregnancies and I had some health things, which meant I couldn't walk. So I was in bed for a lot of that time. And it's not that we don't share how difficult life is because it was really difficult for both of us. Michael was kind of single parenting our family and it was not what we had envisioned or wanted. And so you know, I was podcasting that whole time and I told everyone how really hard it was, but the punchline was always and I trust the Lord, Yeah. right? So we can just say like, I don't know what's going on right now and it is rough, you know? But the punchline is I'm not gonna cut and run on Jesus because that's all that there is. So I don't know what the purpose is of this and I'm not quite to joy status, I'm working on it. I know I should, yeah. but I trust him and I'm not leaving and I'm accepting this cross. And that I think is the peace that they sense in someone who really, really believes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, last thing, I want you to, you know, considering everything we talked about in the testimony, what can you, what can you say to people that let's assume that they've come to this channel or this video specifically, and they are one of those people that's chasing down every single doctrine. I need to have an answer. I need to have an answer. I need to have an answer. What advice would you give to that person? Because I, I know that you, you said something in the past to me, or maybe it was Michael, concerning that. And I just want to know what kind of advice you would give to someone that's at that stage in the journey. Yeah. You know, I think there are different personality types uh, who pursue, you know, Catholicism in a different way. My husband has a very analytical um, personality type. So he did. He wanted to read a lot of, like, the, the doctors of the church and the church writings and really understand the ins and outs. And if that's you and you want that, I would say, great, you know, go for it and do it. That's a gift that God has given you. That doesn't have to be the answer. You can just choose to believe and have faith. And I think the best barometer for where you're at and the work that you need to do is that peace component. Because here's the thing, when God is tugging on your heart, it like feels like there's a rope attached to you and he's pulling on it and that's why you're asking these questions because you're feeling called to him and to communion with him and if you, if it gives you more peace to read all the books and find the answers then do that he's asking you to do that but if it sounds like it would be full of peace to just accept and to just say you know what lord i don't understand all of these things but i'm all in and i want to live with you 
that's okay too. I think sometimes we feel that we have to know all of the doctrines of our church to be able to defend them. And I didn't. I just chose to be Catholic. And when people ask me questions, I would say, you know what's so beautiful about Catholicism? There is 100% an answer for every single question that you have. And I can go help you find it. I don't know the answer. You don't need to know the answer. That's what's awesome about Catholicism. It is all written down somewhere and everyone agrees. Yeah. I mean, we ought to agree, but you know what I mean? Like the body of, of the Catholic church agrees. And so that gave me so much confidence to just like run into Jesus's arms and hug him and say like, I'm going to live in your house now. I don't know who the 12 apostles are and that's okay. But like, I'm all in with you. And if somebody asks me about it, I'm just going to say it's because I have peace when I'm with him. So you just don't need to know all of the answers. Excellent. Excellent. Sterling, thank you so much. And like I've mentioned to pretty much every guest, the transparency is huge. Mm. And I um, really do wish you and Michael the best in your marriage and how you're raising your children. Just God, God be with you. And uh, for those that watch this episode, I invite you to subscribe to my channel. And please, if you know reverts and converts to the Catholic faith, please send them my way. I would love to chat with them. Until next time, take care and God bless.